We're going to talk a minute about doing some things that may seem strange to you. We're going to talk about skill development because diagnostics is a skill. Back in 1985, Dr. Benjamin Bloom, in collaboration with some other researchers from the University of Chicago, conducted a study to understand how world-class skills are developed. And yes, automotive diagnostics is a world-class skill. Bloom developed a triangle representing the improvements needed for each stage of the skill. It's a triangle because things at the bottom are easy and as we go to the higher skills they become more difficult. The higher skills go beyond understanding to the evaluating stage. This is the stage we're going to have to be using for diagnostics. You know people who know our, we call them book smart. They know all the answers in the books but you give them a real problem they have no idea where to start and how to do it. That's not something that's wrong. It's simply a matter of where they are in this skill development. First you've got to develop this understanding, then you move up. Here's Bloom's triangle. It represents the skills needed and the difficulty. The narrow it is, the more difficult. Everybody can do it at the bottom. As you get to the top, it's far more difficult. So these are the population of people applying this. The population gets smaller as you go up. Let's talk about our basic stuff. Let's talk about Ohm's Law. Somebody wants to teach you Ohm's Law, you understand diagnostic circuits. But knowing Ohm's Law does not tell you how to diagnose a vehicle. Now I'm not saying you shouldn't know Ohm's Law, but Ohm's Law standing alone does not diagnose vehicle problems. You need something beyond that. You have to analyze the circuit. Analyzing and evaluating is where we're going to go for diagnostics. So what we're showing you is we're going to try to move you up this triangle where there's fewer people, where you become more valuable and hopefully make more money. Automotive circuits are kind of a diagnostic thing that are difficult. We're going to develop a diagnostic approach for different types of automotive circuits to help analyze each circuit because these circuits function differently. Each circuit classification has a specific diagnostic steps that needed to locate a problem with the minimum number of diagnostic steps. Diagnosing by testing everything is not productive. You need to focus your, your testing. Now there are always choices in testing and we will show our reasons for our choices. But don't get us wrong, we're not saying ours because you're going to make your choices that may be different than ours. Neither yours or ours is wrong if it does not take more time. All we're trying to show you is our approach to getting more time. As you move up the triangle of skill, you will develop your own test and start creating your own diagnostics, which is the top of the chart. So we're going to go back and break automotive circuits into diagnostics by specific circuit type. We have power and ground distributions to power devices. It could be relays, lights, PCUs, analog brake systems, whatever. Everything is going to have power and ground distribution of some type. Relay activated circuits are used to control power, turn it off and on. We use a low current to, through a coil to mm -hmm. magnetically close a high current switch. Logic devices are activated for circuits with logical controls. We turn dome lights off and on. We turn blinkers and headlights and taillights off and on these days with logical devices. We have two and three wire sensors for measurements sending the information to the ECM or whatever computer system that's using it, electronic control module. And we've got special pressure and flow sensor measurements for different things and we have dynamic signals for specific functions. Things like crank and cam. Each one of these has a separate diagnostic. Now they all are going to have some things in common. The basic diagnostic rules we have for all of those is we have these set of rules that is applied to everything from light bulbs to electronic control units. Here are the rules. First, determine normal and abnormal operation. What is normal operation? Can you identify it? Can you identify abnormal operation? This is where your specifications become important. You determine the requirements for normal operation. If this is a sensor that measures pressure, is it connected to a pressure source? Ask the basic questions. Everything is going to need power and ground. It may be 5 volts, may be battery voltage. Does it have the proper power to operate? Does it have ground for a reference function? 
does it have the inputs or actions necessary for normal operation? Let's talk about these inputs or actions that are necessary. You would not expect the brake lights to operate normally unless you depress the brake pedal. So we're going to be using these things early on. We'll use the lighting circuits, power and ground distribution, and look at these things actions. We're going to determine these actions by looking at the diagram and interpreting what it takes to make a particular light to come on and where does it get its power and grounds and so forth. But let's talk about our pattern analysis. In pattern analysis we're going to identify all the devices that are not performing properly. Either the bulb is too dim or it's not lighting or it stays on when it should not be on. Whatever it's doing that's not normal operation. We can use visual observations, if possible, like we can with lights. And we'll use power and ground and lighting circuits in the beginning because they have all these elements. No one is confused, and we can easily put this concept to work. We've got to determine device operation. When you put your foot on the brake, brake lights come on as we expect. Turn the headlights on. Do the taillights come on? They can be easily viewed. That's an easy thing. We'll do that first. Then later, we'll talk about computer controls that can be observed by looking at scan data, if you have good specifications. Many people just look at scan data where something is badly wrong. Remember, we're looking for abnormal operation, not necessarily dead sensors or sensors that are totally inoperative, but ones that are not working properly. Vehicle performance is another part of this. You can observe the performance of the vehicle during a test drive. How does it operate? And the big thing is list all the symptoms you've observed. What have you seen? This may make life easier. You'll understand this when we go into our pattern analysis. Then the final thing, and it's just as important, select the most efficient test equipment and procedure for the symptoms you've observed. We don't want to jump off into super high-tech stuff that takes a long setup time if we can do it simpler. But when time requires something more advanced in equipment, don't hesitate to use it. Let's talk about power and grounds. We're going to start with power and grounds since they are required for all devices. Power and ground distributions pose some special diagnostic problems, not because they're difficult, but because of the way the diagrams. The OEM diagrams group everything in a series of pages. It can be four or five pages, maybe even more. That can make analysis difficult if you don't use pattern analysis. We can't fix the OEM diagrams, but we can show you our way of using them by using pattern analysis, by identifying good and bad circuits. How do we start? Well, we start with circuit mapping. We will use a map of the normal circuits in one color and abnormal circuits in another color. What we're looking for is a pattern. Here's a pattern. The map will point us toward, to a point where the problem circuit comes to a common point. If the failure is affecting several components, if several things are out, it's because some common circuit is out. And these pattern mapping will bring us back there. This common point is the best place to start testing. Now we can start with the simplest test procedure and work up. The problem that can affect one circuit by itself and no others will be isolated from all the other circuits that use the same common wiring. You'll see that when we get into the, to the diagram. We're going to use a case study to illustrate this process to help you understand it. Remember, this process we're using starts with lighting, but as a course of time, we're going to show how it applies over the whole range of everything from engine performance right on down. Let's start looking at our case study. 